record. Thanks for uh, being with Chantelle and I tonight. Um, I wanted to start this evening uh, talking about plants and climate as we are seeing them at the Means of Production and Trillium site by first just situating ourself, um, ourselves in that we are on the uh, traditional and unceded contemporary territories of the Hamakuyam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples who have been the uh, tenders of the land here uh, since time immemorial. And I'm starting this evening's uh, talk off by showing a uh, screen share or a, a small sample of the um, map that was assembled for where fibers were coming from in this area, uh, assembled by elders uh, from various nations working with um, Museum of Anthropology. And I have, um, had access from the Museum of Anthropology and Cody Rocco to print this. So I'm very thrilled to be sharing it. To uh, start off, I'm just gonna point out here, if you can see my cursor, uh, that says you are here. That's referring to the UBC um, uh, campus. Uh, that's the point for where UBC is located. So the first thing you're gonna recognize is that the waterline feels completely wrong to what we're accustomed to seeing. We are looking at this from the Coast Salish perspective where land is at the top and water is at the bottom. So thinking about this, this is where UBC is. If you follow a little further up, that would be Stanley Park and where we are working is just right around in here. And so the logos that are around just to the right, this would have been probably, I think that is um, Barnston Island or in around um, for the Salish Woolly Dog that is also visible uh, from some of these other icons. And then plants that we're talking about tonight, there is the stinging nettle, which is this single leaf that you can see is being noted for these different places where stinging nettle was coming from. And then also, the Indian hemp or um, wild hemp dog bane plant. And that is two leaf symbols that are being uh, referenced here and, and a few other places up um, onto Vancouver Island. So um, fireweed is a small red dot on this map that doesn't show very well, but it is kind of all over the entire map. And of course, recognizing that um, just because stinging nettle was not showing in these areas doesn't mean stinging nettle was not in those areas. It's just not what elders were able to identify as being a spot that uh, was in um, known trade route um, knowledge that's been passed along. Thinking about what we're doing in this work, it really comes back to how we can be honoring and supporting those plants and the traditions and thinking of how we're building this to the future. So coming into a map from 1905 approximately of Vancouver, it might be 1895, um, there's Stanley Park here in the background. The area that we work in is uh, traditionally known as Squai Chase. And the two sites that we're looking at, Trillium with means of production just a little further south this would have originally been a waterway where Trillium is right basically on the shoreline. Means of production is on that steep hill that comes up from the intertidal zone that is Squai Chase. The two sites are very, very different. It's hard to believe looking at this photo that there is that much of a difference in the um, altitude, but there is uh, about 27 meters uh, of an incline as we head up. Uh, from Trillium to the means of production site. So means of production is a garden that's much more established. It's uh, uh, over 20 years at this point, and it also has a uh, built-in irrigation uh, that we can control. And it is in what I think of as being real soil, that it's built on the side of a hill uh, where land already existed that we have been uh, working and terracing and building up. Uh, Trillium on the right 
is a site that is that intertidal zone that is um, infill and gravel with a very, very shallow amount of topsoil that has been added to that. It also does not have irrigation at this point that we're in full control of. The irrigation uh, that is limited that's there and it is hooked up specifically to the um, the lawn and lawns are shut off for watering in May. Um, so we don't get any water happening into our planted zones uh, after that shuts off without doing a lot of physical labor to hook up hoses. Um, so there's much less water happening at the site of Trillium than there is what we can um, manage to control through um, the irrigation at MOP. So that's a little bit of context to just bring you up to where our two sites are. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chantal. So what is this in science? We'll get to the slide in a moment, but first I want to introduce why we're here. What is this project about? How did it come to be? And it basically comes down to Amanda and Carla for you to know is in a fit of like climate anxiety, I reached out to Sharon to ask what, like, what are your thoughts on how climate change is affecting the plants at MOP and at Trillium? Are you noticing differences in the two sites? Have you noticed differences in like your year to year management of plants being ready for harvest at different times of the year or things flowering on a weird schedule or some plants dying at one site but thriving at another site? And I was just like, I'm seeing this in my own green spaces where plants are getting really stressed out. And of course that has other like cascading impacts, but I was wondering what was happening at MOP and at Trillium. And Sharon was like, yes, <laughs> yes, uh, I am noticing this. And I would like to dig into this a little bit deeper. And so that prompted the conversation for us to write this project into a grant and then to organize a series of walks. Um, so through 2023, we had a series of walks in MOP and in Trillium where we invited people to join us walking through the gardens and exploring topics like what's going on with the soil here? Let's talk about the rainfall or lack of rainfall and like how are we mitigating that with irrigation or soil management practices? What kind of climate events are we noticing in this year? And how is that impacting the green spaces that we're in? And so those talks were a great way to bring people to the space in a way that wasn't directly the like earth and traditional programming where people were engaging in natural dyes or stewardship or fiber art. Um, because one of the other questions was, are there people in the neighborhood who want to engage with the sites, but not necessarily in programming or in processing fiber? And so this was a way of testing that out. Um, the citizen science part of it was because we had started talking about what are we noticing? What could we observe? What can we record? And we settled on information, collecting information about the rainfall and about temperature changes at each of the two sites. So Sharon and I set up little weather stations. That's the that's in the photo there, the blue. What would what like the blue stand station? The blue unit that is in the foreground there. Um, and on we set up one at means of production and one at Trillium. And on each of them, there's a rain gauge, which is a tube with incremental measurement marks, like five millimeters, 10 millimeters, and so on to collect rainfall as it happened. Um, and then the dial that you see on the blue unit is a temperature gauge. So the way it works is as your temperature fluctuates throughout the day, it tracks that. And then there are additional hands that track the lows and the highs. So if you know the low of the day is 10 degrees and the high of the day is 30, 
you would be able to see that in the fluctuations of the actual temperature. And so where does citizen science come into this is that once the weather stations were set up, they were also given a QR code linked to a form that invited people to fill out. And so the idea was that for people who were walking through the park or already at the garden as part of a program, they could take a look at the information in the rain gauge as well as the temperature and then input it into the form as a way of participating in this project. Cool, so that's the project. Now, what is citizen science? Does any, has, anyone, has anyone participated in citizen science before? Inviting your voices into the chat or into the space. I think that that's a no. I didn't realize I'm 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 I couldn't have my video off, but I was not muted. Um, yeah, I've I did a bio blitz, uh, with I yeah. just like, uh, going to a site and logging all the the any species any living species that's there that could be logged, um, yeah, which was which was quite fun. That's cool. Um, okay, thank you for sharing that. Um. Things like bio blitz and like uh, water quality sampling and invertebrate sampling, those are all different kind of citizen science projects that are available in the city. Different environmental stewardship groups will launch projects like this because they want to engage people into collecting some information, creating space for discussions, and getting data that they can work with, um, whether it's for education or whether it's to inform management practices, citizen science provides that. Um, it is information collected by anyone who wants to participate. So you don't need a bachelor of science, you don't need to be a biologist, you don't need prior training. Um, and that was something that was important in the build out of these weather stations. The instructions were in the form, it was we try to make it as accessible as possible in terms of the location of the weather stations, as well as the height of the temperature and the rain gauges, because we wanted to make sure that children, adults, um, people that use wheelchairs, that everyone could have a means into this. And the, the location of that was important as well, making sure that it was accessible by anyone using different modes of travel. Um, it is important to note that while the instructions are provided, the collection of them and the recording of the information is not supervised. So what we mean by that is that there's room for interpretation. You know, you can tell people put slot or put this item in this box, but that can be interpreted different ways. And so when we look at the data collected by citizen science, we have to give it a grain of salt. Um, we have to trust that people are engaging in the process to the best of their ability. And we also have to acknowledge that there is potential for mischief. And you know, one of those mischievous moments was the first day that we had the, uh, the first time that we took people out on a walk at Trillium, we had set up the weather stations and then when we returned to the rain gauge, you have to imagine that the rain gauge is two meters away from a water tap. And when we got there in the bone dryness of July, someone had taken the gauge and filled it up to the brim of like cold water. And there had been zero precipitation. And all we had to do was laugh. So acknowledging that, that this is in science. Um, it is also a great way to engage people in a process that they might not otherwise have opportunity to. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, yeah, why does it matter? Why do we care? Um, again, it creates space for people to engage with the garden spaces without participating in garden stewardship or programming. So a lot of the opportunities to engage with Earth Hand are tied to a time, um, you know, Tuesdays from 4 to 6 p.m. or Saturday 9 to 3, 
And we recognize that people are coming in and out of these garden spaces at different times. Maybe they're walking their dogs, maybe they're out for a smoke break, maybe they need a bit of quiet time, but it was a way to engage people to that space. It creates an opportunity for mindfulness and observation. Part of the form that we had people filling out asked people to listen, and we'll get into soundscapes in a bit. And it's also a step towards quantifying the observations from previous years. Um, and so now that the weather stations are in place, we can have a discussion about whether this is something we want to continue doing and continue collecting that, that data and seeing how we can grow from there. Um, and also what I found really valuable is a project like this has created space for us to have conversations about how climate change is affecting our garden spaces and the programs and the communities that we are in. So that's why. Okay, some quick stats about what we've collected. And I'm sorry that these slides aren't like super jazzy, but this was, let's get this information out there in a quick prep session for this. Um, so it's worth noting that the information for MOP and Trillium happened from July 19th, because that's when we put in the weather stations. And then the most recent input of data for MOP was February 1st, whereas Trillium hasn't seen one since December 14th. So this is again where we need to put on the citizen science lens and understand that it's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison of the two sites, but the way that we're showing the data, I hope kind of gives you a glimpse into what the differences are. The number of entries, we had more entries at MOP than at Trillium, 35 versus 30. And something that was really interesting in the data as Sharon and I were going through it was, we noticed that at MOP, there were no instances of double entries on a single day. Whereas with Trillium, we saw four instances of two entries. So whether people were just like going through the site and really uh, pulled to enter in data that day, who knows? But that's worth noting because um, yeah, there, there is a bit of repetition in the data and we chose to keep the numbers as they were. Okay, so when were people submitting data? This was also something that we saw that was kind of, to me, interesting in terms of timelines. Just under half of the people at both MOP and Trillium were submitting data between noon and three o'clock just by sheer counts. And I think that that points to both the volume of foot traffic that's in the gardens at that time of the day, as well as when people are inclined to stop and engage with a installation. The earliest entries were at 1038 and 558, and then the latest entries were after sunset at 803 and 906. Um, and so that is also important because it gives you a sense of what the actual temperatures were at the different times of the day where people are entering in the information. If someone's coming through consistently at six in the morning, the actual temperature is going to be lower than if someone's coming through at three in the afternoon. Um, this is a rough breakdown of when the entries were made at each of the sites. So you can see that the bulk of them were done in August and September, which also lines up with when there's more foot traffic out in green spaces in the city. And then it tapers down as we move into the cooler months. And so that is just something that is worth knowing and acknowledging. Go to the next slide. Ooh, okay. And before we talk about the actual temperatures, um, we should acknowledge the hypotheses that we had between the two sites. Sharon, is it okay if I speak to this or do you want to jump in? Yeah, okay. So when I approached Sharon, I was like, are you noticing differences? Are you anxious about this? What's going on with the harvest of different plants or like the same plant grown at two different sites? Um, 
one of the things that we talked about was because MOP is on a hill slide, because there are big mature trees there, because there's a actual, like, because there's actual soil there versus at Trillium, where it, it feels much more like a urban, urban site with grass fields. There's a lot more concrete around. It's flat. The soil is built up directly on top of gravel and grass. Um, it's just different. And so what we assumed was that it would be wetter and cooler at MOP and hotter and drier at Trillium. And so the, the hypothesis was that if that was true, then that would have an impact on when different plants would be ready for harvest or when they would be flowering or whether or not they would thrive or really struggle at the different sites. So that's what we were like, could we gather enough information to really test this out? Okay, so back to the slide. These are the actual temperatures. So what we're looking at, as you might notice, is not scientific data because we had a whole discussion about how do we present this information in a way that is one, digestible, and two, actually representative of the information that was given to us. And there wasn't really a good way of showing, you know, on July 20th at 3 p.m., this is what we were seeing versus September 21st at 2 p.m., this is the information that we received. So then that came down to, okay, we want to kind of see how many or what were the most common temperatures that we were seeing or that were submitted at each of the sites and creating a word cloud was a way to show you that information in a way that provided you a snapshot without saying these are the actual temperature trends. So what we're looking at on the left-hand side is the MOP actual temperatures and Trillium actual temperatures on the right-hand side. You'll see that some of the bigger, some of the numbers are bigger than others. And what that means is the number 22 for MOP, that, that was repeated a couple of times versus the number seven or the number eight at MOP, the smaller the number, the fewer times it was represented in the data. So then when we look at Trillium, we see 30, 40, 23, 20 as our larger numbers. That to me at a visual sense is that it was hotter at Trillium than at MOP. We're not seeing 40, we're not seeing 30 at MOP. So take with that as you will. I am choosing to interpret that interpret that as it was warmer at Trillium when people were taking the temperatures. Okay, now this is where it gets kind of really cool. So again, we have MOP on the left-hand side and Trillium on the right-hand side. These are the temperature lows. Now remember, the temperature lows are what the, is the figure that was captured at the lowest that the actual temperature hand had reached at a given time before the whole unit was reset back to zero. So what we're seeing here is that MO, at MOP, there's an entire range. We see the numbers 11, 16, six as the largest, but we also see a pretty high high at 25, right? So that means at some point in the summer, the lowest temperature was 25, and that's still pretty darn warm. And then on the other side with trillium, we are seeing 14, 12, 15, so pretty moderate temperature, temperate temperatures, but we also see a low of 27. So this is where we have to look at this with a grain of salt because that 27 could be could have been recorded when someone had reset the temperature gauge, you know, late in the day or midday, 
And then that was still a low that was reached. Anyway, the words. Um, what we were curious about is whether there would be lower low temperatures at MOP and higher low temperatures at Trillium. And we're not sure. And I think that that is a, we need more data and it'd be interesting to see what this would look like in future years. So we did the same thing, uh, or it's the same system for the temperature highs. The highest point that was recorded by the temperature gauge is reflected here. And the number that is like glaring standing out is 40. Whereas we don't have that at all at MOP. And I think the fact that we have 40 at Trillium and not at MOP does send a strong message that Trillium was a lot warmer more often than MOP. Because we're also seeing 35, 28, 30 repeated a couple of times uh, throughout the course of the season. So that was really validating for me to see. And it did loosely confirm the fact that Trillium is warmer than MOP. And Sharon will get into that a little bit later about what kind of an impact that has on the plants that are growing there. Okay, rainfall collection. This was funny. This was really funny. So we had a really warm May. We had that heat wave. And then we had bits and spurts of rainfall throughout the season, but it was less than we normally would have received. And we didn't have like massive atmospheric rivers um, through the fall. We had a couple of big rain events, but they weren't as extreme as we seen in like 2021, 2021, 2022, 2021. Um, and we can see that most often people were seeing zero in the rainfalls. And so then that kind of ties into, okay, if we're not seeing a whole lot of rainfall at the sites and MOP has irrigation systems built in, whereas Trillium is watered by hand by volunteers, then what does that mean for the survive or like for plants that are trying to survive in the two sites? Okay, so we talked a little bit about the soundscape earlier, and I am now realizing how hard that is to read, but this is a snapshot of the form that people were invited to fill out uh, when they were at the weather stations. So in addition to looking at the weather stations, we're like, okay, what else is going around at the site? And like, is that kind of impacting people's experiences there? So we asked people to note down if they were hearing things like bird song and wind through the leaves of the trees, um, if they were hearing dogs barking and playing because both sites do get a fair bit of dog traffic or dogs and people traffic. We're also curious about sports. Both sites have fields nearby. At Trillium, there, there are sports fields where like soccer and rugby, I, I don't know, sports, fall sports, they're happening consistently on the weekends. And then at, at MOP, there's a flat field where I've seen people play anything from soccer to frisbee to like circus arts to dogs chasing their balls, um, people having picnics, and there's also a track there. And so there's a lot of activity that's happening. We're like, are people noticing this? And then of course, because we're in the city, we were also asking about people noise, like just people conversations, as well as our folks noticing generators or construction um, or sirens. And so we were just asking for nothing to its background noise to this is really distracting. And we'll head on into the next slide. And what did folks hear? It was this. Minimally, we heard generators, construction, leaves, and people doing sports as background noise. And the, of course, the generators and the construction were the 
noises that were hard to ignore. And I don't think that that's a surprise, but I think that it's something worth considering when we're thinking about how the gardens are functioning. Like, are they pleasant places to be? Are people wanting to come and sit there? Will someone want to come sit in the garden for a lunch break if there's like construction going on? You know, that is hard to ignore. And so, yeah. Okay. And I'm going to pass it over to Sharon to talk about what we observed about the plants. Thanks, Chantel. Um, so I've got uh, four plants here that um, I wanted to um, talk about and what I was observing, um, partly what I've been observing over the years, but specifically this year as we focused on this project. So um, this is a common milkweed or Asclepius sericea. I don't think I'm pronouncing that properly. I want to point out that uh, there's a little map here of its um, usual zone. And so you'll notice that it doesn't normally appear in um, in this part of the world. It's uh, just a little bit south of us um, in uh, Washington state into Oregon. Um, but uh, what we've found is growing at means of production and trillium. It's been a plant that's been very interesting to see how it different, how it is different from the two sites. So going through here, following um, often what was happening with the data presentation, MOP will be on the left for images and trillium plants will be on the right. There are some slides where I've got um, presenting the entirety of a plant all at once, but here's um, milkweed at MOP on the left and trillium on the right. Um, of note on the right, there's a seed pod that's visible there. That was the only seed pod that actually showed up at trillium this year. Uh, I think there's like two on that stock. And this is not the first year where the trillium milkweed has um, underproduced on any seeds. But I want to um, first just acknowledge that it's very late coming out of the ground. It shows up uh, the beginning of May and um, grows rapidly, really, really quickly. Uh, so it's a perennial, it's coming up out of the ground uh, around May 2nd, it first appeared. So it was already uh, about eight inches high or, or a foot high by the 15th of May. And by May 27th, it was at full height and there were seed or uh, flower heads forming. You can see that um, picture on the right hand side. Um, and that is just showing the spot at Trillium where the milkweed is growing. It's it's unbelievable how fast this plant grows most years. And this year with the intense heat that we had, uh, it came on uh, that much, that much faster. Uh, the milkweed at means of production, uh, it's a wetter soil. It's up in the top beds um, near the sidewalk and kind of under the apple tree. It likes the dappled shade of that area and it likes the kind of wet feet that it typically has in that zone. Uh, so the flowers were in um, full bloom by mid-July that is visible on the top left. Um, lots of butterflies to be found in the milkweed there. And it has generally just really excelled at MOP and is, you know, in future years, it might be a bit of a going concern where we're trying to contain it. At this point, it's just a beautiful plant to allow to spread out and enjoy. Um, at Trillium, um, as you could see, perhaps in the earlier photo, it's got gravel all around it. And so it doesn't have anywhere to actually grow. And I think that's the reason why it is not putting out any seeds. Uh, any seed pods. Um, it's we've tried transplanting it to several other places around Trillium, and it never it never survives. And I think the reason why this does okay by the um, edge of our work bay is because there is water in that area continually being on. So there's water in that zone, um, similar to why the willow is doing so well. Um, this is also a spot that's easy when we're emptying a bucket at the end of the day 
uh, from studio work, we can just kind of throw an extra bucket of water over towards the milkweed. So it gets far more water in this area than the other plants do in the garden. Um, at Trillium, these stalks were ready for harvest by uh, October 8th, which is quite early. Um, you can see the leaves were yellow and were starting to drop off. And it was, um, uh, stalks were dry. Um, so it means a production. This was one of the things that I found really interesting this year is recognizing that the means of production um, milkweed uh, at a higher altitude and where it's been colder, I had uh, been assuming, I think forever, that the plants were generally in more of a position of stasis and not rotting as, as quickly at means of production. And I actually discovered through this project the opposite to be true in regards to the milkweed because of how wet the soil is. Uh, so the milkweed seemed to rot much faster at the means of production site than it did at Trillium where the soil is drier. Um, here you can see one of these seed pods that is opening up uh, and blowing open. We had different sessions where we were harvesting the fluff and using that. And one of the things that we observed this year was that the uh, there was a seed pod that had burst open and I think it was raining. And so the milkweed was actually, the fluff was actually stained and it was kind of a tea color, um, taking up color from these seeds. And so I was curious if there was a tannin that could be accessed from the seed. And I'm gonna show you that in a minute. Um, this on the right is looking at the fluff that's available, as well as the fiber from the stalks. And it means a production. We had quite a bit of stalks at the end when we were um, doing a cleanup in November and a harvest. We'd really kind of missed the season on some of this milkweed. You can see these stalks are um, yellow, but they've also, um, they were still the fiber was there, but they were so slimy from um, this velvety skin breaking down. But if you look closely, you can see there's like the fibers that are evidence still um, in the process of breaking down. So rotting, but not quite rotted. And all of these holes, of course, where um, there's pollinators on site that are using these stalks as homes. So this was a tannin test. Without getting into too much detail, there's a, a way that you can test for how much tannin is in a plant, uh, knowing that tannin and iron, when in combination, will give you a gray. So if you're testing a variety of different materials and you limit how much you've got in um, um, changing content for here, we were using the same amount of milkweed seed in weight to what we were using in some of these other plants. and that level of gray that you can see to the original white of the cloth tells us that yes, in fact, there was some um, tannin in the cloth and also just how interesting it was that the colors that we were getting of dye essentially from the milkweed seeds themselves were kind of interesting to, to learn this year. So my conclusions about milkweed, um, harvest the stalks at MOP earlier than at Trillium because they rot before the stalks ret. Also, that stalks can be water retted instead of left to root ret for long bast fiber from the stalks. The Trillium milkweed only grows near shipping container uh, where the water source is um, and they are not producing seed pods due to the inability to spread, but the MOP milkweed is thriving the trillium milkweed is there primarily for demonstration and discussion. So next year I will be harvesting MOP uh, uh, much earlier and doing some water redding of that. Stinging nettle, moving on to another plant that uh, is the plant I'm the most familiar with of all the plants we were looking at this year. And it baffled me the most. It was one of those experiences of anything I thought I knew I could throw out the window this year. Um, here's a, a little map um, again from the um, USDA that's showing um, the range of stinging nettle, the Urtica dioica. 
Um, this year, again, May, we were having temperatures, uh, 28 degrees was really common through the month of May and there was no rain. And we actually had at Trillium um, seeds forming uh, at the end of May, there were seeds showing on the stalks. Normally that's something that is connected around solstice for harvest. Means of production, however, was cl much closer to what I would think of as the actual time of when I'm expecting to do a seed harvest uh, for uh, nettle seeds um, around summer solstice of July 21st. The Trillium site, again, being a really dry, hot site. In the past, this has been a fantastic area for the, the nettles to grow. Um, the nettles did not do well this year, and there were some other factors that were playing in beyond the environment, but generally um, noticing here this top left photo, May 15th at Trillium, the stalks are dry, the bottom leaves are already dropping, and the fibers were strippable, so there was still enough moisture in the stalk that we could get the fiber bark off, but there was at that point, so little fiber, it hadn't grown enough yet. So there wasn't really any fiber to be working with. It was quite weak, um, but uh, the plants themselves looked, um, appeared to be more what we would see in August as opposed to May, which is really disturbing. Um, now, one of the things that nettle does similar to other plants is it will put up a fresh new growth of um, a new flush of leaves. And so, these are the stalks of what they looked like um, first week of December. They were dead on the top. There were no leaves on them. The tips were gray or brown, but then there was young, fresh um, leaf growing on the bottom. Uh, it was really bizarre. The means of production nettles are interplanted in a much shadier um, partial, partial, partial sun location and they're interplanted with fireweed, mahonia, ocean spray and other native shrubs. Um, I did notice on um, the photo on the left, you can see again, this is in May, there was some signs of um, heat and um, drought with some yellow leaves that were, um, were forming. This is an area, uh, though it's at MOP and it does have some irrigation, the irrigation in this zone is really, really nominal. Uh, so it's not getting a lot of water like our top area um, that has uh, wetter soil. This soil does tend to be quite dry. So the trillium nettle seeds, um, May 30th were, was the harvest date for um, trillium about three weeks before the usual harvest and also 11 weeks before the MOP nettle seeds. We're ready. So that was one of the more extreme, you know, I actually went and I looked at the photos and I checked the dates and then I counted the weeks through in my calendar three separate times because I didn't believe it was actually 11 weeks difference between Trillium and MOP on where the plants were setting seed. That was really stunning to see. So stinging nettle conclusions. Um, in general, 2024 was a really poor year for most vast fiber plants, um, flax, hemp, and nettle, all being the primary fiber plants. Um, for flax, plants were half the height often to usual, and apparently it is not even possible this year to get flax seed from Europe if you're in North America because of the shortage, um, I'm assuming, that has happened uh, the challenge with growing flax in Europe in 2023. Uh, this was a big thing with the May heat drought um, during the prime growth cycle that we were experiencing here. Again, there was very little rain and temperatures were quite commonly in the high 20s. The MOP woodland plantings did far better. Most years, this is the secondary zone to what I think of as being the primary site of trillium nettles. This year, the MOP nettles did far better. I didn't actually harvest uh, probably three quarters of the nettles at Trillium. I just let them be this year. Uh, if the May hot trend repeats in future years, um, things that I will take into account is looking for any seeds to harvest earlier than usual. Also planning on a stock harvest midsummer and do a water ret and harvest resulting uh, flush of greens for teas near fall equinox um, a little earlier than usual for getting um, a secondary flush of um, 
of leaf for tea. Also, uh, I want to look at planting trees, um, preferably alder around the nettles at Trillium, just to give a little bit of shade and a little bit of a heat break in that zone. We've got four plants we're looking at. This is our third. So fireweed, uh, you can see again, this map up at the top that shows the far reaching range of fireweed and where it grows at um, uh, uh, in North America on Turtle Island. And one of the things that um, is so lovely to see is how early these fresh sprouts come up out of the ground. So you can see over here on the left, these lovely young uh, fresh leaves coming up in March 15th. And over on the right hand side, this is the same image as where the um, uh, at the bottom there is dogbane, the next plant we're going to look at. It's just starting to come up out of the ground here on May 2nd, and meanwhile, the fireweed is already two, uh, two feet tall in some areas. It was kind of crazy to see how fast it was growing. This is before the May heat even began. So um, for Trillium, um, with that May heat, everything uh, rushed forward at a great frantic speed. And the seeds were actually setting here. You can see in this July 9th photo, which is probably three weeks earlier than what it was in both 21 and 22. I went back and checked and 22 uh, was a little later, but 21 um, was um, still uh, happening later than what we were seeing last year. So, uh, the flowering and fiber fluff collection were both four to six, six weeks earlier than what we saw in 2022. And again, 2022, things were later. So there's still this radical shift that's happening um, in changes from one season to the next. Uh, I did notice that the seed fluff harvest at MOP was looking quite, um, quite accessible. Um, the third week of July, where at that same time, we were able to do a bark harvest off of the stalks at Trillium. Normally, I am not able to get bark off of stalks at the same time as I'm collecting fluff. And normally, I see those happening um, at, at, in, in a different rhythm as opposed to simultaneously. So this that was really kind of fascinating. Um, fireweed was another plant that I did a tannin test on and was really interesting to see how much tannin came from October harvested stalks. So again, the shade of gray is what's kind of giving us a baseline of how the iron and the tannin are sitting together and just how dark this cloth is actually being dyed by, by the fireweed stalks is kind of fascinating. It's, it's really kind of... Um, parallel to the sumac you can see that's beside it. And sumac is a um, plant that's known for its tannin and it's often used for tannin. So this was really interesting to see that fireweed was kind of on par. So my fireweed conclusions, um, early starting plant uh, gave it some resilience for spring heat and drought. It was already up and, and doing quite well by the time that May heat came along. The stalks can rebound with new leaf flush after dropping leaves in summer heat drought. So we've noticed that that happens often with fireweed when it drops its leaf in um, July and early August. Um, fresh leaves will start to appear um, uh, when rains will begin again. The harvesting timeline for the flowers, the fluff and the stalks are all blurring and overlapping between the gardens, um, which is fascinating and bizarre. And the MOP fireweed has yet to truly have space and get going. The hillside planting um, is to be monitored. Uh, the MOP plants generally were three to four weeks behind Trillium for the few um, fireweed plants that we do have there. And the final plant uh, that I want to share is the dogbane or the wild hemp Apicinium, cannab Apicinium cannabinium. Uh, and here again is a map that is showing us a range. This map is actually for spreading dogbane. Uh, there wasn't a map for the, um, the Indian hemp, but um, 
uh, the provinces are and the states are are very, very similar. So uh, this is a plant that grows all across um, this continent and it is very parallel to milkweed. I think I think of them as cousins. Uh, they come up out of the ground within a day of each other. Uh, here we are again, this is the May 2nd. So here's the dogbane just popping up out of the ground where the fireweed is two feet tall in and around it. However, by May 30th, so less than a month, this dogbane has grown to the full height and is matching the height of the fireweed and both plants are in flower. So where the fireweed started March 15th, um, this is several weeks behind in starting but makes like no trouble in catching up. And again, May was our month that was really, really hot. Um, my experience has been that the dogbane and the milkweed both come up late and grow rapidly, but I'm going to be watching this year and just seeing if um, uh, quite so rapidly is normal or if that's an anomaly that fits with the, the heat wave that we had in May. So again, growing super fast. Here we are. You can see there's fireweed that is setting seed in the back um, 11th of July. And here is the dogbane, which is also setting seed. You can see these long green pods that are hanging on the plant at this point. So by July 11th, um, the, the seed is already forming uh, and the plant just drops all of its bottom leaves. You can see how these stalks here, they started with far more leaves than this. And what the plant is doing in the drought is dropping all of its leaves um, on the lower part of the stalk and just keeping some top leaves to help shade itself. Uh, and then the plant stays erect and seems to do really, really well in the drought and the heat. The fireweed looks to suffer far more. It's far more dramatic than the, um, the dogbane is. Here's the, um, the dogbane in December. You can see it is um, at this point that I was harvesting um, more of the seeds. I did harvest some seeds before this, but um, most of the seeds and the stalks were harvested in late December. This year, we could have harvested them a little bit earlier, but they seem to stay quite well. And for the dogbane, it seems to be a game of trying to nail the timing so that papery skin has um, broken down a little bit. Uh, losing its uh, slightly waxy surface. It's not as waxy as stinging nettle. It's not as gummy as stinging nettle, but it does have a slight wax to it that we just want to break down. And you can see the leaves have gone from this green color to this kind of pinky red. So this was the first full year of growth for means of production. We transplanted um, plants over in the spring, early spring of 22. And so this was the first year that They've had a year of growing underground with the roots continuing to grow. Here it is coming up um, probably about eight inches high, May 15th. So it was just a day or two later than Trillium for coming up out of the ground, but remarkably different seeing what the plants look like here in July. These are just a few young sprouts that are here. Some of the early ones that came up um, have um, dried up and appear to have died off and then new sprouts were coming up. So there isn't a lot going on above ground with the dogbane yet. Um, will be interesting to see this year if this plant is going to sort of stabilize and, and take off. Um, I do believe there's a lot happening below ground that we just can't quite see in this photo. And this was an interesting one as well. Um, thinking about where the milkweed seeds were at and what was happening for actually getting some tannin and some dye from those seeds. I was curious what would happen with the, the dogbane. Um, it is known for a dye. We have a dye sample that um, Anna Haywood Jones did as a part of her project a couple of years ago. But here you can see the color um, chart that came up from using um, not the seed itself, but that dark seed casing. Um, that is um, uh, otherwise not being used for anything. It's put down to just compost back into the soil. 
And here is what the stalks are looking like of the, um, the dog bane when I was harvesting end of December. And you can see here that those are the fibers that we're pulling off. And most of these stalks are quite smooth and dull as opposed to the shiny ones. The shiny ones still have a little bit of a waxy surface to them. So the dog bane conclusions, um, similar to the milkweed, it's slow to emerge in the springtime, but really rapid growth once it's established. The first few years spent setting down deep roots and less above ground growth that's visible. Uh, the ability to drop the lower leaves and thrive through drought and heat once it's established. And the harvest time for the seed pods, for tannin, the seed fluff for fiber and the stalks for fiber are all after first frost and extend into winter. So I don't feel the timeline on the harvest of this as being as impacted quite as much as perhaps the um, um, the nettle and the fireweed are. Uh, I think we could, uh, it would be interesting to see once dogbane is more established uh, means of production and if we get it going in a wetter zone, if there's kind of a similar parallel where it's gonna rot faster because of that wet soil. So that's it for the plants that I wanted to just present of what we were talking about and really um, uh, focusing on studying over this year. But I did want to point out a couple of things that uh, were just bizarre anomalies to me when I think about what this year has been like, uh, what this last year was like for the growing season. Uh, these were both taken on Willow Harvest Day. So here's aphids just in like large um, communities clustered on the willow stalks when we're harvesting the willow. I don't remember ever seeing this before. I also don't think I've ever seen calendula or scabiosa flowering um, from our summer annuals still in flower when we're harvesting willow. That was kind of crazy. And I'm going to stop sharing at that moment and I'm going to uh, end the recording. Uh, I will say before I end the recording, because it's the very last image, uh, but I want to say a shout out of thanks to the Vancouver Park Board Neighborhood Matching Fund that has supported this project this year. And um, uh, thanks for hanging out and stay until the end.